Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? So we've had several lectures and gone to the lab twice. Uh, any question about the way the semester is going to go? Yes? Well, I had a question. Uh, so um, you send a, a, a lot of your emails every week telling us about like how all of our assignments are doing. Uh -huh. So in one of the assignments I did, I passed it on the test, right? But I got that it was formatted incorrectly. Uh -huh. Is there like a way I can see if I, 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 is there a sheet that shows you how to format or? In the, in the issue, there should be there should be some blue okay. uh, link. You can click on it. Okay. So click on it, and then it show it 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 goes to a web page that shows you what the format is expected to be. Okay. Cool. Yes. If your comments aren't, if you just leave the comments section in there and don't delete it, it will mess up the format of your code. Well, you can leave the comments. This is fine. But you have to format it. But it has to be. I deleted mine. It has to be at the right level of indentation. Yeah. So, so your comments are, by definition, at the right level of indentation if there aren't any, right? <laughs> yes. Um, programming one zero one five, like the grade isn't showing up in the grade book, but it is averaged into my final grade, and I don't know like what. Like it just goes straight from O one four to O two. It's it's just missing. So so if you'll send me an email, I'll I'll put that column in there. So, some, someone send me an email in, in case I don't remember to do it, please. Other questions? Yes? Have the uh, previous uh, grades or previous homeworks, the first ones, uh, have they? The, the written homeworks? Yes. Have they been uh, posted yet? Like you mean the, 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 they've not been posted yet? Oh. They will be. I, I expect to do it over the weekend. Oh, okay. Other questions? So specifically, what he was asking about, for those of you who haven't had me as an instructor before, uh, these, these things get scanned. And then you'll, you can download scans of your assignments, the graded, the graded versions of them, from the same place that you download the originals. But, but that has not occurred yet. Other questions? OK. So today's uh, what? Thursday, of course, but the 7th? OK. So you had a, the, at, the, at the last, at the closing moments of last time and one of your programming homeworks, we had uh, the following multiplication function. Uh, it was what, it, what we want is a multiplication function with signature naturals cross reals, and it produces a real. And what we want it to do, what we want it to do is n multiplied by x, n multiplied by x, but <laughs> we're only allowed to use uh, to use uh, division <coughs> by 2. We're allowed to use division by two, and we're allowed to use uh, uh, addition and subtraction. So now, so that means in any addition is going to be permissible, and any subtraction is permissible. Uh, but uh, division is only permissible when it's dividing by two. Okay. So why why that? Why are we singling out division by two as being somehow special and permissible? Sure. Yeah, it was, it was part of that homework you just turned in, right? So, so <clears throat> I have a question for you. Uh, in base 10, <clears throat> so this is, a, this is addressing why, why specifically are we interested in division by two. In base 10, which, which of the following tasks is easier? Uh, 2370 divided by uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 2370 divided by 1, 0, 0, 0. Which one of these is an easier task for us? The second one. Why? Why is, it, why is, this, why is the one on the right essentially a triviality? 
just shape the decimal around. Right. But all the, this one, because a because thousand is a power of ten, it's ten to exponent three, what this is saying is shift, shift the, the point three positions to the left. That's what this is saying. So this one is easy. It's easy, and we can just do, you know, one, two, three. So it's 2.370. Whereas this one is, who knows, right? <laughs> if it, and, and by this division, I mean the division that includes decimal places. So you'd have to keep going, you know, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so then, so that means for us, division by 10, in fact, any, any power of 10 is, is easy because we're in base 10. So by the, way, by the way, essentially all human cultures at this time use base 10. Why is that? 10 fingers, that's it. There, there's no other good reason, okay? If, if, if we could go back in time, let's, let's say it like this. If, it's, if it so happened that human beings had four fingers to a hand, still two hands but four fingers to a hand, what do you suppose the base we would count in would be? It'd be eight. It'd be eight. And in fact, where mathematically, that, that, would be, that would be a preferable situation, right? Because 10 is not so excellent as far as bases go. Okay, but whatever, we have 10 fingers, so we count in base 10. Now there's another, uh, th there's, there's at least two other somewhat common bases in human cultures, but only in history now, because essentially every extant human culture counts in base 10 because now we're all bumping elbows and we have to be able to talk to each other and we all and you know the majority won right now we're going to do base 10 but what's what's another common base for humans 20 <laughs> why do you think 20 is a common base fingers and toes probably probably okay but even there's another one and this one is slightly surprising 60. And why is 60 such a common base? Three people with fingers and toes. Fingers and toes. <laughs> well, that, maybe, you know, it's con <laughs> conceivable. But I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you what at least I consider. I don't know the reason, you know, I can't go back in time. But, but the, 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 the most outstanding reason that I can see is that there are so many divisors of 60. Uh -huh. Right? 60 is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, finally we miss 1, 7, right? And then not 8, not 9, yes 10, not 11, yes 12. So that means that you could take 60 things and divide it into, into smaller groups in a, in a variety of ways. So base 60 is actually quite, quite common also. And that sort of rears its head in our timekeeping, right? Because there's 60 seconds to a minute, and then 60 minutes in an hour. So many 60s, right? So, so 3,600, the number of seconds in an hour, is also eminently divisible. It can be divided into lots of little pieces evenly. OK. So that being said, what, what, what base do the machines that we're using operate in? Two. They operate in base two. Now, when you type at MATLAB, y y y you type in numbers in base 10. Like, if you want to type 13, you type 1, 3. But what MATLAB does is it immediately, it, it says, I know that you're, you're telling me 13 in base 10, so I'm gonna con I'm, but I'm going to convert it to base 2. Okay, I'm going to convert it to base 2. So uh, the, way, the, the way you do that, for example, for example, uh, we could have, say, 25, 25, and, and I'll say that this is 25 in base 10. So that is to say, it's the tw when I say 25, it's the 25 that you're usually thinking about. So how do you represent 25 in base 10? Uh, sorry, how do you represent 25 in base 8? Well, the question is, how many... How many eights can you take away from 25? Three. You can take away three eights. So the first digit in base eight would be a three. And then if you take away three eights from 25, how much is left over? 
just one. So that's saying that 25 in base 10 is the same as 31 in base 8. It's the same as 31 in base 8, <coughs> which is the uh, origination of the joke. If you say for base 10, if you write it DEC for decimal, and then for base 8, you write that uh, oct for octal. This is the reason why mathematicians can never tell the difference between Christmas and Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so dividing by two is, is quite easy for the machine. So that's why it's uh, permissible uh, to divide by two. So here's the definition of that multiplication function. So in the first place, the answer is 0 when n is 0. That is to say that if you, if, if you multiply 0 by any real x, the result is 0. Okay. Yes? What if you try to go back in the base from 31 and base 8? And you ask yourself the same question, same process. Mm -hmm. Don't you get 3 and 1 again? No, be, no, because this is this is thirty one in base eight. So the so so the answer to the question is is that this in base ten in base ten would be three times eight three times eight plus uh, well three times eight to the one and then plus one times eight to the zero and this is now all construed as being in base ten. So 3 times 8 to exponent 1 is 24, and then 1 times 8 to exponent 0 is 1, and the sum of those in base 10 is 25. Okay, so then again, going back to this multiplication uh, thing, there were two more cases. What were the cases? What were, what were the conditions for those cases anyway? Even and odd. Even and odd, right? It, it has to do with the parity of uh, of n. We know that word, right? Parity? No? Yes? So, so like when I say what's the sign, what's the S-I-G-N of 5, I say S-I-G-N because otherwise it sounds like S-I-N-E sometimes. What's the S-I-G-N of 5? Positive. Positive. And what's the S-I-G-N of negative 8? Negative. negative. So I could ask the same question about numbers. I could say what's the parity of 8? Even. What's the parity of 8? Even. What's the parity of 9? Odd. So we have two cases, and they correspond to the parity of n. So one case is when n is even. That is to say that when you, when you uh, divide it by 2, there's no remainder. What is, what is the computation you have to do? So you invoke m again, but with new arguments now. n over 2. n over 2. x times 2. x times 2. And I'll write it as x plus x, which is, of course, 2x. OK. So fine. Uh, that's in the case that n is even. The last case, of course, is when n is odd. And what do you do in this case? x plus <coughs> mm -hmm. and x. <coughs> so now let's, let's, let's think about these, these clauses for a moment. So in the first place, clause 1, is, is, it, is it correct? Is it a correct clause? Is it logically consistent with what we're trying to do? Yeah, right? Because if you multiply by 0, you're going to get 0. Okay, clause 2 and 3. So we're now kind of looking at the clauses. Clause 1 is saying that yes, in fact, 0 times x is 0. That's what clause 1 is saying. What is clause 2 saying? It's saying that if you have an even number divided by 2 and then multiply the other number by 2. Mm -hmm. It's saying that in the case that n is even, isn't it true that n times x is equal to 
n over 2 multiplied by 2x. Isn't that true? Yeah, of course it is, right? Because we're looking at it from, human, from the human perspective. Can you cancel the twos? Of course you can. That's what clause number two is saying. What is clause number three saying? Okay, so now it's saying that n times x, that is to say, and remember that n times x means, it means uh, x plus x plus x plus x plus x n times. So if, there, if this was 2370, there'd be 2370 x's. Clause 3 is saying that this is the same as x plus n minus 1 times x. For example, for example, 20x's is 1x plus 19 of them. That's what it's saying. So, so all, of these, all of these clauses are, in a sense, somewhat, somewhat trivial, right? Now, now that you've kind of looked at them in this way, they all do sort of a trivial thing. But let's, let's evaluate m somewhere for some particular arguments. So for example, let's evaluate m of, <clears throat> say, 100 and x. OK, we'll just leave the x there because it's not really relevant. The action doesn't occur uh, with, with the x much. OK, so which clause do we need to invoke? The second clause, that is to say the even clause. So, so. The second clause says that this evaluation of M is the same as another evaluation of M, but with, with different arguments. So what will be the new first argument? 50. And what will be the new second argument? 2x. Uh, 2x. Because isn't it true? that 100x is 50 multiplied by 2x. Sure it is. OK, now, now which clause are we in? The base clause, the zero, so that is to say the zero clause, the even clause, or the odd clause? Even one again. OK, so then that's this one. So what are the new arguments this time? 25 and 4x. OK. Now which clause must we invoke? Odd clause. So that means that now we have to do something slightly different. What do we do now? Yeah, this 4x comes out. We take away one of the 4x's. This is saying we have 25 4x's. Yeah, you take one of them out, and then what? Take one from n. So this is saying you have 25 4x's, and this is the same as saying, well, here's one 4x, and there's 24 more of them. OK, fine. So now for this m, for this m, uh, which clause will we need to invoke? The second clause, the even clause. So plus uh, m of what's the first argument? 12. And the new second argument? 8x. OK, again, we'll do the even clause. So this, this would be 4x plus m of some arguments. So what arguments? 6 and 16x. Again, we'll use the even clause. What are the new arguments? 3 and 32. X's. So now we'll, now we'll need the odd clause. 
Okay, so what do I have to do? Yeah, take out the 32 X's. And then now what's the new arguments for M? Two and 32 of them. Because this is saying that we have three 32 X's, but that's the same as saying here's one of them and there's the other two. So that was the odd clause. Uh, now, we, now we need to do the even clause. So this would be m of 1 and uh, 64 x. And then now finally we do the, we do the odd clause, but not, not finally, I guess. Okay, so then 4x plus 32x's plus 64x's, and then what are the new arguments to m? 0 and 64x's. So that was an odd clause. And now finally, finally we get to a, cl to a clause that doesn't recurse. That is to say, it's the, it's the one that, that is finally, finally clear. So 4x plus 32x plus 64x plus 0. zero. Now, I hope that you notice a very close similarity to one of your previous exercises, right? What if I asked you to compute 100x with the doubling technique? Do you remember that? When I was kind of asking you to do it by hand? This is exactly what you would have done. Right? Because this, this is the biggest power of 2 that you can take away from 100. 64 is the biggest power of 2 you can take away from 100 without overshooting. Then you would have 36 left. And then the biggest power of 2 you can take away from 36 without overshooting is 32. If you take 32 from 36, you have 4 left. Then the biggest power of 2 you can take away from 4 without overshooting is 4. four. Terrific. Now, you might be concerned a little bit, I hope, that um, you know, maybe, maybe there's some crazy natural number n where this would get stuck and never finish executing, right? Maybe it would just sort of go on forever. Like maybe there's some really big, strange number that's a natural that this, that this function couldn't compute, n times x. Well, let's, let's argue that that simply can't be true. So this, is not a, this won't be a proof, because I'll leave that for your number theory classes. But I'll show you that it's entirely plausible. So what I want you to do is in this, in this example computation, I want you to look at the n argument. So the first n argument was 100. Okay, then the next one was 50. The next one was 25, then 24, then 12, then 6, then 3, then 2, then 1, then 0. So all the green boxes, those are all natural numbers. Okay, And in particular, I'd like for you to notice what's true about these, these clauses. So that, that clause requires, requires nothing. If you come into that clause, you're done. Now, what if you make it into the even clause? If you make it into the even clause, necessarily, what is the smallest possible value of n if you made it into the even clause? <laughs> two. It's two, because it it, first off, is zero even? It, zero is even. What does it mean to be even? It means that if you break, if you break that many things into groups of size two, you won't have any left over. So 24 is even because how many groups of size two can you make out of 24 M&Ms? 12. 12, and then how many will be left over? Absolutely none. none. So suppose I give you, and in fact, I have given you, in front of each of you, a pile of zero M&Ms. 
<laughs> okay, I want you to break that pile into groups of size two. How many groups of size two are you able to make? Zero. zero. And how many are left over when you're finished making your zero groups? Zero. Depressingly zero. Zero. Is zero divisible by two? Yeah, because the remainder of division by two is zero. So this clause matches first. So if n is zero, you match the first clause. The next smallest even number is two. So that means that that means that if you make it here, notice that the new argu the new n is going to be smaller than the previous one. It's going to be smaller. If you got here and n was 100, then n is going to be 50, strictly less than 100. If you got here and n was 2, the new n is going to be 1, strictly smaller than 2. n is always smaller if you make it into this case. Furthermore, if you make it into this case, when the n is odd, for example, if you get here and n is 39, then what's going to be the new n? 38, which is strictly smaller than than the, than the end that, was, that you got there with. So what I want you to see is that this sequence of green numbers, in the first place, is a sequence of naturals. It's a sequence of naturals. Furthermore, it is a non-empty sequence of naturals because you had to start somewhere. And it's counting down. It's counting down. Which means that all of these green numbers, all of these green numbers are, are a subset of the naturals which are non-empty and bounded above. Okay, so that means we can invoke the big gun for, 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 for the natural numbers. What's the big gun for the natural numbers? The w w well orderedness. That's the big gun. Is that we have a set, a non-empty subset of the naturals. It must have a least element. It must have a least element. That means that this computation will always terminate. It can't, it can't be that there's some strange natural out there that you were to plug it in and then somehow this function would lose its mind and, and, and compute forever. Yes? So you're saying like this is only though because we're using naturals and because like they have a stopping point. Right. Yeah. Right. The, in the end, the, 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 the guarantee for the, for the termination of this program is is from the well orderedness of the rat of the naturals. Other questions. So another thing that was part of the part of the question on the on the homework is that uh, counting how many times this this worked. How, how many steps did you have to do? So let's see here. For this particular one, we just have to count the number of clauses that we invoked. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We had to invoke ten clauses. Okay, so, so it took on the order of ten steps, depending on exactly how you're counting. What if we were to do this in the old way? That is to say, let's just do x plus x plus x plus x plus x, a hundred of them. How many steps would it take? It would take a hundred steps. And this one takes ten. So, so it, what I want you to see is that, in that sense, this one is better. So, suppose I wanted you to do 2,370 times x. Then, if you were to do it in the old way, you'd have to do 2,370 steps. Approximately, how many steps would you have to do if you did it in this way? How many would you have to do? I, I have to do it with my calculator. I can't do it in my head. Definitely down into the hundreds. Uh, it would take approximately 22 steps. It would take on the order of 22 steps. Now, how, how can it do it so quickly? It takes it down exponentially. Okay. It's because, it's because Notice that the even clause, the even clause halves the argument. And you're going to hit the even clause about half the time. You'll hit it every time if you happen to have a power of 2, right? If we plug in a power of 2, like 1,024, you'll hit the even clause every time. If we plug in some number that's not a power of 2, you might hit the odd clause. But notice what will happen every time you hit the odd clause. 
it immediately takes you to the even clause. Because if you got here because n was 19, then the next n is 18, which is even. So you hit the even clause at least every other time. At least every other time. And so the question is, is if I give you an n, how many times can you half n until you're, you're less or equal to 1? How many times? You, you all know the name, but you just don't know the name. Is it what is it? Is it some of the names? Yeah. Okay, is it logarithm? Yeah, lo the logarithm, right? Logarithm base 2. How many times can you half 1,024 before you get to 1? 10 times. 10 times. Because 2 to 10 is 1,024. Okay, alternatively, the logarithm base 2 of 1,024 is... 10. 10. And because you're going to hit the even case half the time, at least half the time, that means that this will, this will converge on the order of 2 times the natural log of 2, uh, sorry, 2 times the log base 2 of n. Okay, so this is quite quick. For example, if I gave you 4 billion, if I said do 4 billion x, well, you could add together 4 billion x using 4 billion steps. But what's the logarithm base 2 of 4 billion? It's about 32. This is really quick in comparison to the naive way. Good. Any questions about that? OK, so now we're going to play a game. So now we're going to play the game. Everyone got, got some paper? I'll leave it up here if you get it. Okay, so just a brief comment about the game, <coughs> about the grid, is that uh, this, is a, this is a binary grid in the sense that the, the biggest one uh, has eight, and then the, the smaller ones have four, and then the, and then the next ones have two, and then the next ones are one. So, so each one contains twice as, min twice as many as before, linearly. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to single out somewhere on your grid, I want you to single out a rectangle that has size 24 by 15. So that's 8, that's another 8, 8, okay, and then 15. So it's, it's three of the big ones, and then two of the sm No, I, I went too far. So I need one less than this, 24 by 15. And it's one row less than going the other way. OK. So now in your rectangle, In your rectangle, I'd like for you to observe how many, uh, how many little of the smallest boxes are there in there? Yeah, whatever 24 times 15 is, right? That's how many of the little, of the little boxes are in there. Okay. So now the game that we're going to play is, uh, is notice that we can tile this rectangle with squares of size 1 by 1 because it already is tiled with squares of size one by one. What I want you to do is I want you to tile it with the largest possible squares. So one by one already works. Maybe two by two will work. Maybe three by three will work. Maybe nine by nine will work. So my question to you is, is I want you to think for a moment, what is the largest squares that can tile this rectangle without, without falling over and overlapping? So we can do it with one by ones. Could we do it with two by twos? No. Let's think. Suppose we tried to do it with two by twos. So there's a two by two. Here's a two by two. There's a two by two. Another two by two. Another two by two. 
another 2 by 2, and another 2 by 2. Now, can you see that I've got that little bit right there? I can't fit a square right there. So we can't do it with 2 by 2s. It can't be done with 2 by 2s because, because I can't fit one more square right, right there in that little sliver. Now, why can't we do it? Notice that we could do it with 2 by 2s going that way. It would work. It would work going that way because, because we'd hit the edge and there'd be no gap if we, if we did 2 by 2s going to the right. See, there's no gap over there. So it worked going to the right. Why did it not work going down? Because 2 isn't a common factor of 24 and 15. So I'm not sure what you mean by common factor. I just want to talk about going down. <laughs> 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 right, is that 15 is not divisible by 2. So, so we, can, we can't take away, if we, when, when you repeatedly take away 2 from 15, you're not going to end up with no remainder. You end up with one remainder. Okay, let's try it again. So again with this rectangle, so those of you who, who are starting to understand the game, don't, don't blurt it out, because this will be a big surprise to many people. We're, we're doing something that you already know, but you just don't know, you've never, you might have never thought of it in this way. So can we tile it with three by three squares? Can we tile it with three by three squares? Let's try it. So that's a tile. That's a tile. That's a tile. <coughs> that's a tile. And that's a tile. So it was able to go down. We, di we didn't have any gaps tiling it down. Do we have any gaps tiling it to the right? Oh, we didn't have any gaps tiling it to the right. Incredible. So, why did we have no gaps tiling it down? Because 15 is divisible by 3, right? If you, when you repeatedly take away 3 from 15, you're going to end up with no remainder. And why did it work going to the right? Because 24 is also divisible by 3 with, with no remainder. Okay. So does everyone see that, 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 that there's a connection here between being able to tile down and also being able to tile right? So suppose we're only interested in tiling down for the moment, and we want to tile only downward, and we want to do it and have no gaps on the bottom. Suppose that's what we want to do. What size of tiles would work but only cons c c concerning 15? One, one. One. one would work, three would work, Five would work, fifteen would work. All of those, all of those tile sizes would work, and we'd have no gaps on the bottom. What tile sizes would work so that we wouldn't have any gaps on the right? One, two, two three, four, six, eight, twelve, and twenty-four. And why do all those work for twenty-four? Because they divide evenly. Those are all proper divisors of 24. So now the, the question, the answer to the question is, what's the, what's the, what, what are the largest tile, square tiles we can tile this rectangle with? Well, that means that we have no gaps on the bottom and also no gaps on the right. So we need to take the greatest of all the proper divisors of 24 and 15. And what is the greatest of all the proper divisors of 24 and 15? 3. Right? That's the greatest divisor that divides both 24 and 15. And what's the name of that? The greatest common divisor. That's what it's called. So, so this game is a game that you've al you already knew this game, but I've tried to present it to you in a way that you might not have thought about it before. Answering the question is how, of, of how you can tile this rectangle with squares with the maximum possible square size, that 
the, the side length of the square is the greatest common divisor of these two numbers. Okay, let's play the game slightly differently. Let's play the game slightly differently. So again, we'll do it with 15 and 24, but don't let, let the fact that you know the answer ruin it for you. And we're gonna play the game in a slightly different way. What I want you to do is I want you to take, at, at each step, at each step, I want you to take the largest possible square that you can take, even if, even if there is a gap, even if there is a gap. So notice, well, we could, take, we could take a square of size one, one by one. Could we take a square of size two by two? Would it fit inside of the rectangle? Yep. It would, right? What about a square of size three by three? Would it fit in the rectangle? Yeah. What's the biggest square that we bite that we could possibly take out of here? 15 by 15. 15 by 15, right? Because if you get any bigger than that, it won't fit inside. So let's take a 15 by 15 bite. So we took a 15 by 15 bite. And how, what, what is the, the, what is the, this measurement that is left? It's nine, right? Because of, of course it's 24 minus 15, right? So it's nine. Okay, so now we have a new rectangle. And now I want you to take a new bite. And I want you to take the largest square bite you can take. So we can take a nine by nine. You can take nine by nine without, without falling off off the edge of the world. Okay, so we take a square bite of size nine by nine. And then this, this is still nine, but what is this new size? It's gonna, it's gonna be 15 minus nine, right? Because this was 15 and we took away nine. So now this is six. So this is now uh, horizontally nine and vertically six. What's the largest square we can take? We can take we can take a six by six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And now there's one aspect of the game that, that I didn't bring up. And that is that now we're gonna take again a square byte. What's the biggest square byte we can take? And we're going to take as many of those square bytes that we can. That is to say, we were able to take the first byte, 15 by 15, but we could only take one 15 by 15 byte. And then we took a 9 by 9 byte, but we were only able to take one 9 by 9 byte. Then we took a 6 by 6 byte, and we were only able to take one 6 by 6 byte. But what's the byte size we can take now? 3 by 3. And how many of them can we take? We can take two such bytes. And notice that when we take those two bytes, there's nothing left. That last byte size that you were able to take, that is also the greatest common divisor. Because, because, notice, notice that these are size three by three. What were, these, what were the size of these? What was the size of this one? Six by nine. And six, by, six and nine are both divisible by three. So you could have taken these byte sizes into that. And then what is this one? This was nine by nine. This was six by six. Oh, this was six by six. You could do three by three bytes with this one. This one was nine by nine. You could do three by three bytes with that one. This one was 15 by 15. You could do three by three bytes with that one. So this is also a way to compute the greatest common divisor. You always take a square byte, the biggest possible square byte, and the most of those bytes that you can take. Interesting. Okay. If you were just doing this with like notation, would this just be like subtracting the square from the biggest one you could take? Subtracting the square. We're about to get into the for formalism. But right now I want I wanted everyone to see to see this problem in this possibly new way. But now, now we'll get into it, into the, into the details. So to remind you, 
for all uh, for all n in the naturals and d in the naturals with d more than zero, there exists unique R, uh, and there exists a Q, which is possibly not unique, such that N is DQ plus R, and zero is less or equal to R is less than D. So this is something we've already talked about. Okay, it's saying that if you've got, if you've got a natural, a non-negative integer, and a group size, D, and the group size has to be more than, has to be positive, then um, you can always find the quotient in remainder, and the remainder is, is between zero and D, zero in the group size. The remainder is unique, the quotient is unique as long as, whenever N is positive. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's think about this for a moment. What am I trying to say? Ah, yeah. So when, in this case, when r is equal to zero, that is to say when there's no remainder, D is called a proper divisor of n. Okay, and this is denoted as D and then a vertical bar n, and that is pronounced out loud as D divides n. The negation of the of this is uh, written in this way. You could so to to give examples, you could say that three divides twelve. Three divides twelve, uh, but five does not divide twelve. Okay. Yes? Would you just uh, say one more time what those uh, backwards E's were again? And just like, like say them in, in English? Uh-huh. This one, this one is exists. This one is for all. And then this exclamation point modifier on, on the existence quantif quantification is signifies uniqueness. Okay, and the, the, way, the, the way someone can remember that is, I, I, I hope I did the joke. No matter what, if you ever go to a math conference, and, it, and, and for example, maybe it's in, in, in a, lang, uh, a land where they don't speak English, you can still say this joke and every mathematician will get it and understand. Because if you remember, for example, the definition of limit, the epsilon delta definition, remember it says for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that blah, 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 blah. All, almost a, a, a great many math theorems and definitions uh, take that shape, so here's the, here's the math joke. It's, it's a joke about math theorems. In math theorems, for every for every, there is a there is. <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because look, even this one is part of it. Look, here's, here's this one. Because there's one of these, surely there's one of those, <laughs> right? <laughs> ah. Okay. I'm in, I'm, thank you. I'm actually in this for the jokes. Relatable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, th three, 3 is a divisor of 12. 
5 is not a divisor of 12, a proper divisor. So in a number theory class, strictly speaking, you should call them proper divisors, but I'll probably slip and just refer to them as divisors. Okay, <coughs> so definition. The divisors of n is the set of all d in the naturals such that d divides little n. Okay, and of course, I'm talking about little n has to be itself unnatural. Okay, so let's have, let's have an example of this. Uh, well, how about, please tell me, what are the divisors of uh, six? Right, so this is just a fancy way to say this thing that you already know. The divisors of six are one, two, three, and six. One, two, three, and six. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in the first place, this, this specific set, the, the set of divisors of six, is it empty? No, no because you can see, <laughs> because it's written there. Okay. Um, let's consider all, all, all conceivable ends now. Okay. It, are, there, are there any ends for which the set of divisors is empty? Why not? Let, let's think about it for a minute. What about the set? What about the set of divisors? What what is something that's in the set of divisors of twelve? Okay. What's something that's in the set of divisors of twenty three seventy? One. What what's something that's that's uh, in the set of divisors of one two three four five six seven eight? One. One is in there, right? One's always a divisor. One's a divisor. Furthermore, so is the number itself, right? So one of the divisors of 2370 is 2370. So one and 2370 are in there. I don't know what the others are. For, for, for numbers where the set of divisors has exactly two elements, those are special numbers. What are those called? Primes, right? For example, the set of divisors of 13 are? One and 13. There's just two of them. There's no others. But what I want you to observe is that this set, this set, uh, the divisors, the divisors of, I of n is not empty. So the set of divisors, the set of divisors is, is a non-empty subset of the naturals. A non-empty subset. So what big gun is, all, is, is, is available? Well-orderedness, well right? That means that the, the big gun of well-orderedness is, is available for use. Okay, now here's, here's a disturbing one. Many students are disturbed by this. What is the set of divisors of zero? Uh, X. What things divide zero? One. Everything divides zero, right? If, you, if I said, here's zero M&Ms, please divide them into groups of size seven. How many groups could you make? Zero groups. And how many, left would, how many would be left over when you do that? Zero. So, so seven is a divisor of zero. What else is a divisor of zero? Eight. <laughs> Eight is one of them. Nine's one of them. 2370 is one of them. All the naturals divide zero. Okay, so the set of divisors of zero is the naturals itself, which in particular is not empty. <laughs> okay. Yes? Does, so it's all the naturals, but does that include zero? Or yeah, I'm kind, I'm kind of trying to avoid that point okay. <laughs> uh, be, because I, I, I'm aware that some, some of you are taking number theory and you're currently talking about this and I haven't had time to talk to that instructor to, to ask what, he th what, what that course is doing about whether or not 
what you're going to do is zero. So I'm, I'm avoiding it. Okay. I'm avoiding the, sorry, I'm just avoiding the, the, the issue. Okay, so now, please compute for me the set of divisors of 15, and then after you've done that, please compute for me the set of divisors of 24. And even though sets are not ordered, I want you to go ahead and write them in order, the elements in order. Okay, well, in the interest of time, 1, 3, 5, and 15. And then for this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, not 5, yes, 6, not 7, 8, 9, 8, yeah, 8's in there, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 24. One good way to make sure you didn't leave any out is you make sure that everyone can be paired up with something, mm -hmm. right? 1 in 24, 2 in 12, and if I didn't have an 8, because I almost left off the 8, then I would have looked at the 3 and said, oh, wait, who does 3 go with? Oh, it goes with the 8. Okay. Now I would like for you to compute the divisors of 15 intersect the divisors of 24. One and three. And now in this set containing one and three, uh, notice that it's not empty. I want you to tell me which one is greatest. Three. This is the common divisors, the things that divide this one and also that one, and the greatest among them is three. The greatest common divisor, which is to say, the greatest common divisor of 15 and 24 is three. So now, I have a question for you. We did a specific case, specifically with 15 and 24. I want you to consider the divisors of n intersect the divisors of m. Now, it is conceivable that if I, if I was to give you two sets and you compute their intersection, it's conceivable that the result is empty. So, for example, what is the intersection of the set of positive numbers with the set of negative numbers? It's the empty set. Empty, because zero is, is neither positive nor negative, right? Or I could say, what's the intersection of the set of even positive integers and the set of, and the, with the intersection of the set of odd positive integers? Yeah, empty, empty, right? So it's possible that this could be empty. Is it empty? It, it can't be empty because one is in this one and one is in that one, right? One's in both of them. One's in both of them, so this is not empty uh, because one is in there. One's in that intersection. So that means that the intersection of the, of the set of, of divisors, the, 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 the set of common divisors, is always non-empty. It's always, always non-empty. And furthermore, furthermore, uh, it's not empty. And if we suppose further, that we have an n which is more than 0, suppose that we have an n that's more than 0, please tell me, what is the maximum of the set of divisors of n? What's the biggest one? n. n. That's the biggest one. There aren't any bigger ones. Uh, why did I have to say n is more than 0? Right, because, well, what's the set of divisors of 0? All of them, right? <laughs> is there a maximal natural number? There isn't a maximal one. That's half the point of the natural numbers. Right. So, so supposing, supposing that Therefore, supposing either uh, 
n is positive or m is positive, or both. If, if, if either one, if either one is positive, then the maximum of the set, of the intersection of the sets of these must exist. So why do I, have to, why do I require just one of them? It, it, why do I require at least one of them? Right, Beca because if, if at least one of them is finite, then at least one of these has finitely many, el uh, sorry, if at least one of them is positive, then at least one of these is a finite set. And therefore the intersection is also finite. Okay, so here we, here we have the definition of the greatest common divisor. So I'll write it, uh, I'll write it as GCD uh, of N and M. But for those of you taking number theory, you should know that it's part of the, n number theory has a, those folks who like number theory hold number theory to be the best math subject that there is. U usually, that's my experience. So, <laughs> and, and, and they're, they're good folks, but, but they, they take the following conceit. They say that the greatest common divisor is a function that's so important and so common that it is a function that doesn't even need a name. So in number theory, the greatest common divisor is written this way, as a function with no name. We don't even have to say it. We all know what we're talking about. Okay? But this is not number theory. Uh, this, this, is, this is a course about programming, so I'm going to write GCD. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, it's kind of weird when you get to number theory for the first time and, and then you, you, you write GCD that way. Okay, uh, the GCD is two things. So we're going to define, uh, we're going to define the greatest common divisor of N and M is zero when they're both zero. So this is how we're going to handle the zero case. So there's, there's two different ways, there's a lot of different ways to handle it and this is one way. Otherwise, it is the maximum of the set of common divisors of in the intersection of the set of common divisors. Well, I'm having trouble here. So otherwise. Okay, and then the programming homework will be how to actually go about computing this efficiently. Okay, so have a nice uh, Thursday.